Welcome to XYPN Radio, where your host, Alan Moore, brings you into a community of fee-only financial planners who want to profitably and successfully serve Gen X and Gen Y clients. If you're ready to get the knowledge you need from leaders in your field, learn from forward-thinking advisors, and take action on your own goals, XYPN Radio is the show for you. Here's your host. Hello, and welcome to this episode of XYPN Radio. I am your host, Alan Moore, and today I'm excited to have Bill Simone, founder of Simone Financial Group in Austin, Texas, on the show today. I met Bill earlier this year at the DFW FPA conference and was so impressed with his story. He started his firm just over a year ago and is closing in on 60 client households, has two full-time employees, and will likely be hiring another one here soon. He's a power networker and has found success in getting out and beating the bushes looking for clients. He's a very memorable guy, primarily because of his awesome personality, as well as his tactic, if you will, for helping people remember him, which you'll hear about on the show. Bill has created a very unique service model, leveraging monthly subscription billing, but having tiered services based on adding additional services for higher fees, instead of the typical model of providing the same service to all clients or simply basing fees on assets. It's very cool, and I think you'll walk away with some great ideas. Finally, we talked a little bit about what I'll call the dark side of entrepreneurship. You know, we like to talk about all the good stuff, but there are definite struggles when you're running a business and it can have a dramatic effect on your home life and on your personal life. Bill talked about the struggles that he and his wife have had as the business has grown and how that's something new firm owners need to be aware of. Now, I'll apologize in advance because I know there were some audio issues in recording this episode, but bear with it because this episode is full of awesome content from Bill. You can find any of the additional resources that we mentioned during the episode at xyplanningnetwork.com 126. Also, be sure to go to xyplanningnetwork.com VIP to join our private group just for XYP and radio listeners. It's the community of advisors we've all been looking for that's there to provide support when we need it the most. Best of all, it's free. I encourage you to check it out. That's xyplanningnetwork.com VIP. Without further ado, here's my interview with Bill. Hey, Bill. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much for being on. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. You know, I've been told that one of the most valuable things that XYPN Radio brings advisors, some of the most valuable information, is how to properly pronounce some people's last names. You know, this was where people <laughs> heard it first, that it was Kitsis and not Kitesis and, and Kitesis and all of these other words. So, so today, it is not Simonette or Simon Eat. It is Bill Simone, is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. It's not Simonetti or Simon or Simone or it's <laughs> Bill Simone. Yeah, <laughs> Simone. It's hard for me to say Simone without trying to put a like my southern comes out where I'm where I, I try to use like accents, but it, it sounds just like a southern hick. It's really sad, honestly. I really it struggled. Adds, I will tell you that it adds a little bit of appeal, of appeal to my name, so I, I, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time to to be on the show. You and I officially met at the the DFW, the Dallas Fort Worth area FPA event earlier this year, and then also caught up at FPABE last month. And I remember when we were talking in Dallas just about your service model and the business that you're building. Uh, it was it was really fascinating to hear just some of the work you've you've done and, and the business that you're building, and also some of the the challenges you have faced from a cultural perspective in starting a financial planning firm and that sort of thing. So I'm I'm really excited to uh, to dig into to all of these topics. So I guess to kick us off, give me just a, a, a five thousand foot view of your firm, sort of where things are today, where you're located, number of employees, that sort of thing. Give listeners sort of an overview of the business. Sure, sure, sure. So we are a fee only uh, financial planning first firm is what I like to say. I have two employees, uh, a client service uh, associate and a uh, operations manager. The client service was recently added uh, a couple of weeks ago after my previous one got pregnant and we ended up expanding the business, which was uh, definitely a plus, a positive. We started with uh, very little assets. My first client was launching the RIA. Well, let me back up a little bit. I launched the RIA itself last year in June. I've been independent. I was with a broker dealer for almost three years prior to that. And before that, I was in insurance for over six years. I spent some time as a business broker. And a, a little known fact about me is I was a commodities broker or a commodities trader as well. So I've had some time in this business in a lot of different factions, different ways, 
right? Uh, some of those better, some of those not so good. It's interesting what you learn when you, when you go into an industry in and of itself. We have a little bit over 50, uh, we have 58 clients, 58 uh, client households. We went from uh, 300,000 to right now we're hovering just below 10 million in assets under management. And that's from June of last year till today. 15 months. In 15 months, you have 58 clients and almost 10 million AUM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And two employees. That's incredible. Do you mind if I sort of where is the revenue of the firm today then? The primary revenue source actually is our financial planning services because all clients that come into my firm, uh, at this point in time, all clients that come into the firm uh, come in underneath a financial planning agreement. And at some point in time, they they choose to migrate their assets over to the firm. Mm. Yeah, and I definitely want to dig into the service model. So, uh, but so it sounds like planning fees are are driving the bulk of the revenue. So that that ten million isn't isn't even indicative, which is fantastic. You're you're growing pretty fast. We are. It's uh, it's uh, it's whirlwind. Now I'm I'm actually looking at um, one of the best adages that I've learned, and I've learned this through experience: is hire before you need them. So I'm currently looking for an associate advisor that's going to be able to come on board and help with some of the preliminary planning and helping with managing managing the, pro, uh, the planning process so that I can continue to focus on bringing in new clients. You know, actually run it like a business versus having a, a glorified job. So are you looking for an associate that'll be there in Austin, Texas, or are you open to virtual positions? I'm perfectly open with virtual positions. You know, if clients are all over the country. Um, and that's an interesting thing about our business. I don't actually have to see them face to face. Uh, in order to work with them. All right. Well, you're going to get 30 applications after this podcast recording goes live. So be prepared. you have been warned um, for any associate advisor. The, They'll help me out. No worries. I've got a staff. By the end of this uh, podcast, they're going to, uh, I think folks are really going to want to work with you. So, so you already touched a little bit on the career path, but just sort of walk me through, I guess, your, your path into the industry and, and sort of, you know, is this what you always thought you were going to do? Uh, and, and, how that led you to the decision to launch your own firm last year? Yeah. Well, Alan, I've known I wanted to be a financial planner since I was five years old. Wow. No, I'm kidding. That's, that's a- <laughs> <laughs> that was a thing when I was five. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> this was a this was a falling into. Before my professional life, uh, I, I was a I was in the Marine Corps. So. Um, in the Marine Corps, I joined the Marines. I had a year of college, and then um, I dropped out and went to the Marine Corps at age 19 to really despite my parents because they were going through a divorce, and they were separating, and they were having all kinds of issues. And so I wanted to have a reason to kind of say, hey, look, I'm rebelling now, haha, because I grew up in an island household. And it kind of backfired on me. My mother got – I got the reaction that I wanted from my mother. She was like, oh, no, why would you do this? But I'm, I'm proud of you. You're going to be great. And then my father was like, oh, my God, you're going into the military. That's right, son. You do that 25 years. It'll be perfect. And if you die, it's okay. We'll accept you uh, and we'll remember you. And I said, okay. Um, I was hoping you're going to be a little bit sadder, but that's okay. I'll take it. (laughs) And I went on my first combat deployment when I was 20 years old. At 20 years old, I was deployed to Iraq and I was overseas for seven and a half months. And when I came back, I had more money in my pocket and more money in the bank account than I had ever had in my life. And it, that was one heck of a learning experience because in my household, when I grew up, we didn't grow up with money. We didn't have anything. There was always an entrepreneurial drive, but Understanding of savings for retirement, insurance, those things, that wasn't a conversation that we had in my house. Uh, so I didn't really understand how money worked. And also, I was a young Marine with a jag of cash in my pocket. So at the end of my first deployment, um, I did what most military service members do. When you get out of the military or when you come back from a deployment, you either buy a car, you go on vacation, you go to Vegas and blow a lot of that money. You get a really nice place to stay. Uh, you get somebody pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so true. I mean, you went, if you go to a, a military base, whenever a, a unit comes back from deployment, it looks like a, a brand new car parking lot. Like it looks it like does. a dealership. There's so many new cars. There's so many new things. There's so many money. There's money that gets spent. And first and 15th are, are the best days to be on, uh, be near, near a base. Well, for me, I didn't get anybody pregnant, uh, but I got a nice place. I paid cash for a car, um, and I took a little bit of a trip, and and that was kind of fun. 
but I blew through my cash really quickly because I didn't really understand what I was doing with it. I thought that, you know, I had a job, I'm, I'm, I'm making money and I have money in the bank. I'm rich until I got into a car accident and I totaled uh, a Range Rover that I paid cash for. And I only got half of the value back from the insurance company because depreciation is a thing that I wasn't aware of. And um, I was like, well, God, how much money do I have left? And I was looking at my bank account and I only had like 1500 to 700 to 500 to 300 to almost next to nothing. I had spent all this time in the desert. I spent all this time uh, fighting for this country and I had nothing to show for it. I blew through my cash. And I, my story is not unique because a lot of the guys that were deployed with me and were in my age bracket pretty much did the same thing. What changed for me was I, I said to myself, there's got to be a better way with this, right? I, I don't want to move back home with my parents, with my mom. I don't want to be dependent. I've got to be able to make money on my own and I, I've got to be able to save and, and grow for the future. So I started doing some research and looking for opportunities that would allow me to move forward. Um, some of the guys that were with me in the reserves at this point in time um, had small businesses and were business leaders. And so I, I decided that business was going to be the path for me. So when I went back to school, I decided to go back to school for business and was introduced to investments and financial planning as a path. I got an internship at the commodities brokerage firm, which is where that started. And I started talking to and, and being around people that actually had money and learning what they were learning what they knew that was different than what I knew in terms of saving and experience and, and uh, diversification of cash flow and, and those types of things. I was, in, I was enthralled. I fell in love with it, and I said that I'm going to follow this path in some way, shape, form, or fashion. I didn't know about financial planning itself until, until I moved here to Texas, which was about nine years ago. When I moved to Texas, I started working at an insurance company, and uh, the insurance company was providing agents that were performing well uh, the opportunity to get their CFP certification so that they can sell more insurance. Um, I was one of those producers, so they, uh, they offered me the opportunity to go to the American College. I finished the coursework. I was the only advisor to finish the coursework on time. <laughs> and the first advisor, yeah, <laughs> shock, right? Uh, <laughs> I finished the coursework on time, and I sat for the CFP exam. I actually sat for it twice. Um, the first time um, I failed because I, I didn't uh, put enough time. I ran out of time on on day one of the exam. And uh, the second time, I, I finally got to the point where I was able to put the concept of planning together in a comprehensive manner. And through that process, going getting my education, I became more adept at what the concept of planning was. Also, I was working with business owners who were talking to me about different concepts that they were dealing with, and it was intriguing, and it was, in, uh, it was so interesting to me that I, I, I couldn't pull away. And I decided that that was going to be the path that I wanted to take. And so that's how I got into financial planning as it is today. It was basically falling in butt backwards. I wouldn't use the word butt, but, you know, I don't know how this podcast works, so I'll censor myself a little bit. <laughs> Uh, into the business. Yeah, the, it's interesting that the insurance company actually paid for it, and because they used to do that, I don't. I'm not aware of any company, broker dealer, or insurance company now that does that simply because of the fiduciary rules and and all of that the CFP requires. But it's nice that they did for you at that time because it's a it's a nice bonus. Yeah. Also, if they're still doing it, it's probably uh, they probably stop because they start losing uh, advisors. The financial Very planning true. process for me meant that while I was able to provide more quality service to my clients and provide better um, better advice, information that was useful to them, I sold less insurance. And the less insurance I sold since my paycheck was based on that, the, the, the poor I performed. So it just it, it became less and less of a fit, and I wanted to move into something that was more befitting of the education that I had received. So then was this sort of when you started getting into some of these other areas like commodities trading and that sort of thing? No, commodities trading happened first. So, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So commodities trading happened uh, when I was in school. I interned at a commodities trading firm, and that was that was a terrible experience. Uh, <laughs> I learned how to work on the phone. Right. I I was I was a monster on the phone, but it was a true boiler room setup. It was it was it was not it was not the best experience ever in terms of an intro to helping clients because these were highly speculative investments and they were targeted to people with lots and lots of money 
And me as this young 20 something year old kid on the phone talking to you about, you know, oil and gas futures as, as the be all end all just wasn't the right fit. It was, it was a great way of making money, but a terrible way of learning how to manage and invest. After I worked at a commodities firm for a year, and then I, one of the best pieces of knowledge and education I got was working at a brokerage firm, a business brokerage firm, where I was able to work with a well-established CPA who specialized in business valuations and the buying, selling, and mergers and acquisitions of small to medium-sized businesses in South Florida. Um, I worked with this person hand-in-hand, going through profit and loss statements, reviewing balance sheets, actually talking to business owners about EBITDA and identifying what their average uh, revenues and, and determining multiples uh, for their business for real sales. And I happened to do this in South Florida during the time period when real estate fell out. So this this was uh, 2007 at this point in time, uh, 2007, 2008. And I left Florida in 2009. And I was at that business brokerage and I had the opportunity to really see how business owners themselves ran their business. I also got a chance to see what a glorified employee is. What do I mean by glorified employee? It's not enough to just own a business. If you want to own a business, you have to run it like a business. And many of the business owners that we were seeing were working as employees, right? They had the business in place, but they didn't know their numbers. They knew that they had a good client base. Anytime a client needed or a customer needed something, they called that person on their cell phone. And when the bottom fell out in the Florida real estate market, tourism dried up, revenue sources started to dry up. Now they're running for the hills saying that, hey, look, I want to sell my business. Well, you don't really have a sellable business at this point in time. Because yeah, because it's just you. It's just you. Exactly. But that was a great experience. That was a great education in terms of the process of running a business and identifying value. When I moved to Texas in 2009, that's when I started working for the insurance company. And that's when I was introduced to the concept of financial planning. You know, I was going to, I was thinking like, oh, he's off on his dates because you said you had moved to Texas nine years ago. And then you said you were working in South Florida in 2007. And oh my God, that was 10 years ago. (laughs) Getting old. Like the bottom fell out of the real estate market 10 years ago. What in the world? How does that make it feel, right? Oh man. (laughs) That's how you counted gray hairs. It does not feel that long ago. Um, so fast forwarding a little bit, you, you have this background in, in sort of personal finance in a lot of different areas, or I guess financial services in general, you get your CFP. What was the determining factor for deciding to launch your own business? I guess, what was the, what was it that made you decide that that was your path instead of, you know, continuing to work inside of another financial planning firm or, or whatnot? Great question. So I originally wanted to work inside of a financial planning firm. Everything happens uh, by, uh, not everything was, it wasn't by intention initially. Right. So I wanted to work for a firm. I had a great experience at the firm that, at the insurance company that I was with. I just didn't have a good relationship with my managers. And then I moved into the independent broker dealer world. And the independent broker dealer world worked out very, very well. I was working with an um, uh, independent broker dealer that basically gave me the tools that I needed to start my firm. And I was there for two and a half years. The benefit of being there was I was able, I had my back office completely taken care of, but that was it. You know, I had to develop my own plans. I had to understand the information. I had to work with my clients specifically and I had to take a haircut. Pretty big one, I'm assuming. And during that time, yeah, it was a pretty big haircut. It was a 60, 40 split. And then we went up to 70, 30. And that doesn't really work well for someone that's trying to build a planning firm, particularly. You got 30% or so. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so just for listeners benefit. So you're at a broker dealer where, you know, you're basically building your own business and the broker dealer sort of powering yeah. the back end They're they're handling some back office tasks, but uh, they get 60% and then move to 70% of your revenue. You're keeping 40 and then down to oh, 30% no, no, no. Yeah, of your yeah, revenue, which is a, it was six other way around. Other way around. Okay. So you're keeping 60 to 70%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Got it. I was about to say that is a, that is a significantly larger percentage than I usually hear. So, okay. You're keeping 60 to 70%, but you're still losing 30 or 40% off the top, which, um, you know, a, a really well run business is running 20 or 30% more really. So, so is that where you actually start? So you started your financial planning firm using this broker dealer and then sort of split off 
Pretty much, yeah. So the the triggering factor was one. I was primarily planning. Uh, I, I wanted to start figuring out how to build plans and focus there. I wasn't focusing on assets to, at all, because I, I flat out wasn't comfortable with it. Right? Uh, you know, I'm not an asset manager. I'm not a portfolio manager by any stretch. The benefit of being with a broker dealer was I learned the value of outsourcing. Right? I learned the value of finding professionals to do the the right things for me. I also was able to figure out what my strengths were. Now, the broker dealer that I was with, while they provided great support, it just got to the point where it didn't make sense for me to keep on taking the haircut and pay pay technology fees and then pay E&O and then pay all these other fees to the broker dealer when, in essence, I wasn't using their technology platform. I had figured out what worked best for me. I, I wasn't using their portfolios. My clients were coming to me for planning. They weren't providing me with any financial planning recommendations or financial planning support. So it was all my work. Why am I still taking a haircut? And at this point, now I'm doing research on what it means and how to start my own RIA. What's next evolution in my business? That started pretty much February the year prior. What I'm doing uh, February of 2015, I'm not, I'm not looking into this and I'm saying, okay, there's a couple of choices out here for me. I can continue down this path. This, they, they're providing good research and, and great uh, support, but there's a lot that I'm doing on my own and it doesn't really make sense for me to take up this haircut. And we continue down that path until uh, the broker dealer itself goes through a restructuring and then they send out letters and then they get bought out by another company. And every single, it, it seems like every month I'm getting a notice from my broker dealer themselves saying, hey, we're doing this big change. It's not going to affect your clients, but it might affect you. And so February of last year, I began the process of creating my own RIA. And that goes from February to June of 2016. All right. So when, when you were transitioning over were, uh, to the RIA, were you able to bring your clients with you or did you have non-compete, non-solicitation in place? Oh, man, that's an amazing question. So this is the big difference between working, being a captive agent or working for a large corporation or organization to being independent. When I left my insurance company, I had a non-compete, non-solicitation agreement. I couldn't take anything with me, or so I thought. I walked away with nothing. I was literally walked out of the door when, when I told them, hey, look, I want to go into planning, and this isn't the right fit. Walked out of the door. Computer was taken. All information was stripped from me. When I shared my decision to move in another direction with the broker dealer, they said, okay, well, how much time do you need? The information is yours. Just make sure you transfer it before we fire U5 because at that point you don't have access. So the transition from the broker dealer, smooth as southern butter. (laughs) They were great to work with. Transitioning from the insurance company, absolute nightmare. All right. So where were you at? client wise or asset wise or revenue wise whenever you launched your own when you launched the RA last year and made that transition yeah so last year uh, are you talking about with a with a BD or how I finished out the year yeah leaving the broker dealer into RIA uh, not very much so I finished out the year I mean at the broker dealer my cut of the revenue that I produced was about forty thousand and then I was able to transition my clients uh, from the financial planning side. So I mean I made enough to to have a a, a, a decent job about forty thousand at that point in time when when we transitioned. I finished out the year once I launched the RIA and I transitioned my clients, um, adding another another thirty to that number. So uh, in my first year, I generated in terms of total revenue and expenses uh, total t- total revenue I generated seventy five thousand I think seventy five seventy seven thousand in that range, and then. The hardest thing was to figure out whether I wanted to stay working out of my home or get an office and then when I needed to hire. So take that $77,000 number and then think about uh, this. I wanted to go the traditional path. I ended up buying some computers. I used some of my savings to get furniture. Uh, I got a real office space because I felt like um, having a physical space was going to be valuable for where I'm at in, in Texas. Along with that, I had kids and my children run when they run around my house during um, a conference call that doesn't really bode well. If I have to tell a client (laughs) that it's uh, bring your kids to work day (laughs) every other day, (laughs) they hear kids laughing in the background (laughs) or dogs or dogs barking. Daddy, when are you going to get off of the phone? Daddy, 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 daddy. No, it's biting. No. So (laughs) so it was like, okay, I need an office. I need to go somewhere. (laughs) So just so I'm clear, you separated from the broker-dealer. You started the RAA in June. How many client relationships did you bring over to the RAA when you were getting started? 
15. One five. 15, okay. So you've gone from 15 relationships to 58 relationships in about 15 months. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is insane. So <laughs> just the growth rate. I mean, that's four clients a month. I did, so I did um, a lot of marketing, a lot of, uh, and it, well, it's for on average, but I think what worked well for me, Alan, was the fact that I, I had some time to develop a system, right? And then once I had that system in place, all I had to do was work it and then work it studiously. And the client, the clients grew month to month to month to month. Some months were better than others, obviously, but <laughs> it took a lot of, it took a lot of figuring out what exactly I wanted to do and how I was going to work with my clients and then just literally working my system all the way through the process. So I definitely want to dig in because you don't, I can't let that type of growth rate go and dig in on, on what's working for you from a marketing perspective. But when you were making the transition, what was the conversation like with your clients? Because I know we have a lot of listeners that are in a similar position where they have some clients or where the broker dealer, they're thinking about going independent. And it's sort of a weird, it can be an awkward conversation on like, hey, I know I sold you these products, but like they weren't what's right for you. And now I want to do what's best for you. I guess, how did you manage, or I guess, what was that conversation like? And how did you manage some of those issues? Sure. So the way that I positioned the transition for me was by talking about the growth of the industry and the expansion of my fiduciary responsibilities to my clients. So I told them that I wanted to continue to grow and be able to provide them services that were more efficient for their for their needs. I didn't talk to them about changing products or any of those things, but I said that I wanted to continue to focus on the planning aspect of, uh, of my business and I would love for them to continue to work with me. I brought over 15 clients with me. I lost probably 30 or 40. Yeah, that stayed with a broker dealer because the idea of moving to a small, non-established firm, even though I was with the broker dealer, just seemed, it seemed like unrealistic for them. It was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go work with a guy that's got a, that just put a shingle up until they saw my persistence and my professionalism. And that's a pat on my own back, I guess. <laughs> uh, you're allowed to do that nowadays. And those clients that I moved over with me uh, were really a godsend. They because they they believed enough in me as a firm to say, okay, well, I've been working with you, Bill, for a year, two years, three years, whatever the number was at that point in time. Okay, uh, you're my guy. I'm going to stick with you, and wherever you go is where I'm going to be. So I had the conf- – yeah, you got to have that confidence to have that level of a conversation because if you don't, they'll shy away from you. They'll say, well, you know what? Uh, I think I'm just going to stay where I'm at and also realize that not everybody's going to come with you. Some clients just don't want to move and they'll stay where they are. And if that's the case, be okay with it. So 14 or, you know, 14 moved or moved with you or 15 moved with you. Did, did any of the clients that did not move, did any of them come later or was it pretty much the 15 that moved, moved and everyone else stayed put long term? Uh, the 15 that moved, uh, moved. And then I had a few come afterwards um, of the 50 of the 58 clients that I'm currently working with now, 22 of them have, were previous clients. So I generated the remaining portion were new clients. Yeah. So you were obviously having success from a marketing and sales standpoint when you were at the broker dealer because you had, I mean, you generated a lot of business there. So were a lot of those clients being given to you by, you know, some senior advisor from the broker dealer or were you out sort of hustling and drumming up all of the business yourself? I had to build my business completely on my own, uh, with the exception of two clients that were uh, that were orphaned and then were transferred to me. Everybody else I generated on my own. I built uh, I built every client pretty much from scratch. So, what was your marketing strategy and sort of marketing plan that was so effective when you were at the broker dealer? And then, sort of, how has that evolved with the RIA? Uh, you know, as you've continued to grow. So, we're, we'd actually have to go back one step from there uh, to the insurance company. Because for all of its pitfalls, the I think the biggest value every everything that you do is a learning lesson. Let, let me start there. At the insurance company, I learned how to be willing to communicate and how to put myself out there. Because I had to knock on doors, I had to dial for dollars, I had to go to networking events, I had to do all of these things. Imagine this tall black guy in a suit going to every single networking event that happens. And I used to introduce myself as Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome, right? Because I was the only one in the room. 
So it worked. I had a hook. And in having that hook, people it was hard for people to forget who I was. So if I picked up the phone and called them and say, hey, this is Bill, Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome. We met at uh, X event or Y networking party. I just I wanted to give you a quick call and introduce, your, uh, introduce myself and my services to you. That's what I did. And then um, I would go to events where... I would be the only one in the room. So outside of industry, I wouldn't go to, you know, like networking get togethers, like uh, BNI groups and things of that nature where there were forced leads. I would go and I'd sit at the bar. I'd have a beer and I would talk to anybody that sat next to me. And if they didn't want to talk, great. I turned to the other side and we'd have a conversation and clients would, they would gravitate towards that because it was, it was non-threatening. It was a soft environment. I tell them, here's what I do for a living. If you have any questions or usually what happens at the bar, um, the bartender hears all of these stories about people going through divorce or figuring out what they need to do or taking on their new job. And if I overheard that, I'd just say, hey, look, you know, when, you, when that happens, make sure that your 401k transfers. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's not a bad idea. I actually have a few 401ks that I haven't done anything with. Oh, really? Well, here's some strategies that might help you. And Michael Kitsis has said many times before, give away 99% of the information for free. That 1% is what you charge for, and that's what's going to make you rich. And for me, what made me grow was the fact that while I was providing them with advice per se, um, I wasn't showing them how to implement. And what people need help with is implementation. So I'd say, well, if you want to come into the office and sit down and talk about how to put that in place, I can, I'd can. i love to be able to share that with you. And they'd say, okay, well, that's that's a pretty good idea. Because my style, my approach is very conversational. It's very open. And I've learned that over that time period. And that's what I did to grow the business. I would go to places where it what it didn't feel like a forced sale. It wasn't networking events per se. It was there's a group of people hanging out at the place that I like to go. And while I'm there, I'm just going to talk to whomever is there. Well, you were introducing yourself as tall, dark, and handsome. So that that in of itself is its own. <laughs> its own, it's its own thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I made it hard for people to forget me. Yeah, oh, man, uh, I needed to have a brand. Well, you know, and love it, like it or, or hate it, like it, it was effective for you in terms of being able to just start the conversation, right? Like that, that's really absolutely. what it was intended to do. Uh, that's what it was for. Yeah. So how has that changed then from insurance company to broker dealer to RIA in terms of sort of what, where your focus has been with getting, you know, a, a, in terms of what has been effective from a marketing standpoint? So as I transitioned, what has worked now is the fact that I focus on planning. I'm a planning first firm. As I said earlier, the planning first approach is attractive to people because some of my older clients have established relationships with their wire houses or their investors that they're not ready to move those assets over. But those advisors aren't providing planning. Those advisors are providing portfolio management and everything is tied to returns. Well, returns are only part of the picture. And when I have a conversation with them, we would talk about things such as, well, if you want to retire at 65, if that's the number that matters to you, let's take a look at what that lifestyle looks like. And let's go ahead and build out strategies between now and then to help you get to 65 and survive past 65. Not just imagining the money, but maybe cutting down on your tax picture, downsizing the house, having conversations that were outside of portfolio management. That's where the transition, that's where the conversations changed. When talking about college planning, discussing what school you want your kids to go to versus how much do you want to save for school. When uh, discussing with business owners, their business planning processes or their succession strategies is how long do you really want to do this? And, and what's most important to you about your business versus here's how much you can get for your business if you walk away from it and then we can turn around and invest it. The conversations became more personable. They became more intimate. And so the transition from uh, insurance to broker dealer to financial planning became more of sales to technical expertise to counselor. So were you actually able to to work with clients that had uh, th that already had a quote unquote investment advisor that was working on their investments, and then you were doing the planning for them. Was that really the hook that you know you were able to to work with clients in conjunction with their other uh, advisor? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Because I became a non competing advisor. 
I became somebody that they can use as a sounding board. They can pick up the phone and call me and ask questions and not have to worry about whether or not I'm going to ask them to make another investment or buy more insurance or make another trade. I was somebody that they can pick up the phone and ask, hey, Bill, I'm thinking about buying another car. Um, I've had this car for 15 years. What are your thoughts? Hey, that's a great idea. You've had such amount of growth. You probably need this kind of, uh, based on your lifestyle and our conversations we've had, this is probably the car that you need to be looking at. Let's start talking about dealerships and how we can save you some money on the purchase. No, that's awesome. And and I'm not sure I've had any, I've heard any advisors specifically say that that was their target was really, you know, usually when someone has an advisor, you're trying to talk them into leaving the advisor and you took the opposite approach of just show them what you do and uh, most likely, those folks are going to move over, move those assets over to you at some point. Exactly, because now they're just paying. A, right now, they're just paying a fee to have access to my time, my expertise. I don't care who you work with. You could be at Morgan Stanley, I mean Merrill Lynch, wherever. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you're paying me for my time and my expertise. Now, over time, you're probably going to want to consolidate some of that information because what I may say might conflict with what your planner says. We'll use the car as an example. This is a real case where I had a client that needed a car and wanted to pull money out of his portfolio and was completely talked out of it by the broker because the, the broker said that they need to keep the money in there so it can be invested and he could drive the car a few years longer. My argument to the client was, look, it's your money. The time, let's talk about the time frame for the purchase so that we can avoid capital gains. But you need a car. And if that's what's important for you, use the money that you've saved so that you can get what you want. That's what the money is there for. Ended up moving, uh, ended up buying the car. We waited till January to do it. And then two months later, moved the portfolio over. So how has, I guess, is that still sort of your, your strategy, I guess, in working with clients? Is, is that sort of that has continued and, and still the same, I guess, work that you're doing now? That's exactly right. That's our core process. We are planning first. We start with planning and all clients sign up with a planning package uh, based on what level or what type, what life stage they're in. And then um, over that time period, whether they have no assets or they have a large portfolio or they're high net worth, we talk to them about um, their investments and help them figure out how to use those funds. When we talk to them about how to use their, those funds, that's when the conversation about whether or not we should manage those funds comes up. It's organic. It's not, well, how much assets do you have right now? Oh, you're only at 50000 Well, we only work with clients that are at 150 or greater or 250000 or greater. That's not the kind of conversations we have. So talk to me about your service models because you're one of the few advisors that I've seen with tiered service models based on actual work being done, not necessarily complexity or, you know, net worth income. Like I've seen a few different tiered models, but yours is the only one based on the actual services you're providing. So talk me through, I guess, the the three tiers of services that, that you offer clients. Great question. So we provide a retainer-based planning process that's focused on client life stages. And what I've done was I've modeled my uh, planning practice off of McDonald's for lack of a better term. And I call it the McDonald's model. What clients, uh, when clients walk into the office, my assumption is they've already identified the need for planning or they know that they need some type of advice. Where clients tend to struggle is what type of advice they need. They know retirement is important, but is it important in their lives? College might be important if they have young kids, but the husband and wife don't agree. So what I've done is, um, what make, let me back up to McDonald's. McDonald's, if you walk in there, you know, number one is the Big Mac. You know, number two is a quarter pounder. Number three is a double quarter pounder with cheese. Chicken sandwich is number four, on and on and on. My kids were able to walk into McDonald's and know that they wanted a Happy Meal. They wanted the apples and they wanted to get the, uh, they wanted to get the milk. I knew that I wanted a number one, uh, supersized, and I wanted to get it with a Dr. Pepper, right? I walked in there and it was easy for me to go through the menu and see what it came with. If I wanted to add something, it was easy for me to add. My planning process and my retainer model follows the exact same process. So I have, uh, I have four tiers, investment only, which are for clients that are traditional asset-based planning, uh, asset-based investments or uh, asset-based planning. Wealth builder fundament fundamentals, those are for people that are fresh out of college, starting over, coming off of a divorce, transitioning in their life stage, basic planning, identifying what their core needs are. 
Wealth Planner Standard, which is where the bulk of my planning clients are, which addresses the core, uh, the, the most common needs facing American families today. Retirement planning, basic estate planning, employee benefits, college planning. Then I have Wealth Planner Premium. My Wealth Planner Premium package is for higher net worth clients, maybe more complex scenarios, blended families. And then I have my Wealth Planner Premier. The Wealth Planner Premier is the full CFO type package. If you want someone that's going to be available to you Monday through Saturday, if you want someone that's going to help you with both business and personal issues, if you have custom needs that needs to be completely tailored, that's what that package is for. Each one of those planning packages has a set price point, a set number of hours that comes with them based on my experience working with clients. It comes with a written financial plan, and it works with that client over the course of the year. The reason that I follow this model is because it takes the onus off of the client to decide whether or not they want to call me for a conversation. Since we're not billing on an hourly basis, they know that they have a set number of hours. Since we're not discussing, since they're not trying to figure out what planning uh, methodology matters to them, we can actually go through a living financial plan and adjust that plan over time as it's necessary. Uh, If they want something completely custom or if they're just a pain in the ass and they want to be very complex, I've got a planning package for them and then I can custom tailor the pricing point for them at that planning package. And I also provide all of my clients with a, uh, a worksheet that's called Financial Planning Areas Defined. That worksheet tells them every area that I provide planning services in so that they understand what the definitions are of each one of the planning areas in each one of the planning packages. So you have a lot of different service packages based on, you know, in in trying to cater these services to your clients. Do, Do you or your clients ever feel confused with the different packages and being sure you're taking care of your clients in the right way? Or have you found a way to to be able to provide it appropriately, I guess? Great question. So I, I've simplified it for them. So when they walk into the office and we have our conversations, first and foremost, are we coming in to t- discuss business planning needs or personal planning needs? Well, that that, simpl- that tells us which level we're going. We're either going retail, business, or, uh, or institutional. Okay, let's talk about where you are right now in your life stage. Do you have young kids? Do you have old kids? Uh, are you married, second or third marriage? Uh, that tells us whether or not we're going to be looking at wealth builder fundamentals or if we're going to be looking at wealth planner standard. Are you a high net worth client? Do you have multiple properties, your wealth planner premier or wealth planner premium? How much time do you actually have to dedicate to this? If you have a lot of time to dedicate to this and this is something that you want to work towards, then we start with the smaller packages. If you're an engineer and you have a complex schedule and you don't really have time and you just want me to implement, now we're in the higher end packages. So the packages in and of themselves kind of guide the client to where they want to be. If you have children that are out of school, graduated from college and you know are on their own, then your planning needs just aren't that complex. So the amount of time that we need to dedicate to the planning process is not extremely high. That way we can look at the smaller planning packages. The all, the benefit of that is that it also means that uh, when those assets come over for those clients that are at that life stage, their assets are higher. So now I'm compensated on both the planning process and the assets under management when those assets come by. Okay. So you're able to sort of walk them through that process. Mm-hmm. So. Do you, yeah, do you ever have trouble in the back end sort of tracking which package clients are signed up for and therefore how many hours they're getting and what services they're supposed to be getting? Or I guess what is your mechanism for, for monitoring all of that? That was the hardest part of putting together the packages. And it wasn't uh, determining uh, which package they were on. It was tracking the hours. Because if a client sent me a text message or, excuse me, or if a client picked up the phone and called, If they called my cell phone, which is what they used to do initially, then I had a problem um, because I didn't have the time to go back and put those hours in. Now, uh, my phone system connects with my CRM. So when a client calls, I get the amount of time that they've called and I can add that. Also, I use my CRM for, for managing our calendar. So I know how much time they've spent with us. I don't have to do any excess tracking. It's not it's not difficult at all. Also, since now that I have a, uh, a part-time assistant or I have the client service associate to track some of those tasks, I don't have to worry about it. I know that it's being followed up on. 
So what is your CRM and, uh, and phone system that you're using? I use Redtail CRM. Their CRM, I've been using them uh, since I went to the broker dealer. So I've learned to become very comfortable with their platform and their process. And I use on I use Jive as my phone system. It's a VoIP phone system. We have two phones in the office, one in the conference room and one up front. And the Jive phone system also connects directly with my cell phone. So if I'm out of the office, it'll ring through to my cell phone. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. So I, I've used Ring Central in the past. Jive is a is a competitor. So VoIP Voice over IP is what that stands for. So it just means an internet phone goes across the internet instead of the. Uh, the uh, phone line. So that's very cool that it'll actually pull up the record automatically to allow you to more easily track time and tasks and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if they call in the office, uh, as soon as it calls up, uh, Jive pulls up a little thing on our computer. That's another thing that I I, I did to to kind of control it, to follow follow more of the business growth process. Uh, We all use the same computer, which are Microsoft Surface Pros. Uh, we, uh, I have an IT company that locked out Internet Explorer, so we have to use Chrome. Um, <laughs> yeah, so important. You have no idea. Uh, <laughs> um, and so Jive has an integration with Chrome so that when someone calls, it pulls up their red tail file, tracks the time, and right then and there, I can add the note directly from the phone call. Okay. That's a super handy feature set. So where so you said your most popular package for the clients is is probably the I believe you said the first tier I guess how do how do your clients sort of break down amongst the various tiers of service the wealth planner standard package which is is our most common package we have sixty percent of our clients there we have twenty percent of our clients in the wealth planner premium uh, we have. Uh, Just a few clients in the Wealth Planner Premier, but that's our fastest growing tier. That's the custom package uh, between $5,500 and $14,500. And then most of my Gen Gen X and Gen Y clients are in the Wealth Builder Fundamentals package. So the remaining power portion sits there. Okay. All right. So talk to me a little bit about, uh, I guess, sort of transitioning the conversation just a little bit to, you know, you've now hired two people and then it sounds like a third because you had one goal, maternity leave. So talk to me about the transition of going from solo to one employee to two employees and how that has been for you, sort of learning to be a manager. The most painful process of being a business owner is hiring and retaining talent. And uh, just a, just as clarification, I have two staffers. I have a client service associate. So my operations manager was my client service associate. She went on maternity leave. We hired someone else. She she was so tremendous that I couldn't let her go when uh, my client service associate got back and I moved her into operations so that she can do compliance and more of the back office stuff for us. The most difficult thing to do, in my opinion, as a business owner is hiring and retaining quality talent and giving up control. <laughs> mm, that's so true. <laughs> Last year when I made my transition to the, uh, to, to the RIA space, um, I thought I could do it all. I was like, okay, I can do all the paperwork. I'm going to go out. I'm going to get my clients. And then when they come in, I'm going to have the paperwork prepared and I'm going to track the time and da, 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 right? I quickly learned that as I was bringing on clients, I was falling behind. I couldn't service everybody because I, I hated doing paperwork. So I'd have a great meeting with a client. Let's say it was 5, 30 or 6 o'clock and I've got a stack of paperwork that I got to go through now. I got to make sure that I get it all to the custodian and... <laughs> and filed and get the funds transferred. Oh my God, what a nightmare. <laughs> so it's like, I need somebody. Um, and I bit the bullet and I started looking for, uh, I started looking for just a part-time assistant. Now I couldn't cash flow this because we weren't making any money. You know, I, 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 I was still doing odd jobs. I was working as a server here and there. Uh, I was doing financial counseling to military members for pay, you know, just like a, as needed. And so we weren't really making money um, at this point in time. I was still kind of struggling to, to kind of make it through and living off of savings. And then I found uh, this uh, this person who came from a print shop. She had no experience in the financial services field, but she was like, well, I don't really like where I'm at. And I'm interested in, in trying something different. Um, and she came and she worked in, uh, she came and started working for me. And when she came on board, uh, this is after two or three of hit 
serious hits and misses and almost giving up on this whole process and, and going to a, a virtual assistant type position. When she came in, she was like, oh, I kind of like this. What do you need me to do? I said, can you develop the systems for me? She said, yeah. And she started working on and putting together the systems. And we worked collaboratively to develop the, the process that we follow now, today. Also, when we're getting started, I could only pay her once a month. And I can only afford to have her here for 10 hours a week. Uh, in doing so, she said, well, no worries. I see what you're doing. I believe in the company. I believe in the firm. I know you guys are going to grow, so I'll stay with you. And I said, I promise you, you'll always get paid. It, it's not, it might, always, might not always be on payday, <laughs> but you'll always get paid. <laughs> um, and she said, okay, as long as I get a check, and as long as you don't make me wait too long. And uh, she has been she has been with me since then, and she's she's one of my strongest believers. She believes in the uh, the culture, and she believes in what we do. She's the one that's moving into operations, and uh, she helped me find the client service associate that that took her position. So, how was it for you to become a manager? You know, I mean, it, it's a hard thing to you know, it's a hard thing to learn without doing it. So, I guess how has that education process been for you, learning how to go from you know doing it all to actually delegating and and managing people. I lean on my uh, my experience in the military for this. So when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was a corporal. I was a leader of uh, of Marines. I had a small team that I, that worked underneath me, and I had worked through that process of seeing good good leadership. I understood the value of delegation and having honest, frank conversations with staff. That part wasn't incredibly difficult. Uh, what was difficult was asking, well, what are you comfortable with? At what, how much responsibility can I put on your shoulders and, and trust that you're going to get through? Because for a long time, it was just uh, me and her in the office. It was really easy to have those conversations. It, it got easier to have those conversations. Hey, uh, here's kind of what I'm, uh, here's what I'm looking for. I, I want you to be able to have all the documents and paperwork filed within 24 hours. I need to know that you're able to follow up with a client within 72 hours if, if they're coming in and they're asking questions. Can you do that for me? Sure. Okay, I want you to go ahead and document that. Make sure we have a process to follow. Now there's a process there for that. If a client requests a distribution from their account, I want you to, I want you to be able to follow through with that and not have to call me for every little bit of that. Okay, I've got that covered. Document that, put that into a file. Now we have a process for that. Hey, Jerry, if we have a new person that calls us or a new lead that reaches out to our firm, um, I need you to make sure you add them to the red tail system, put a reminder on my calendar, and make sure that I follow through with that process. Can you do that for me? Sure, absolutely. Hey, Jerry, sometimes we might have, end up having to work late in the office. Uh, what's the time frames that you can, how late can you be here? She said, with enough notice, I can be here up till six or seven o'clock. Okay, great. Let's document that. There's a process in place for that. I need to make sure that I let you know 24 to 48 hours. And then on the other side, hey, hey, Bill, um, I've got a son. I need to know that if, if he gets sick, I can take time off. Absolutely. As long as you're able to get your work done. We have a computer for you. Take that computer with you. And if you need to, get the work done while you're at home. Okay, great. So I can trust there's a process and it's documented. So it was, a, it was the, the learning part was asking, what are you comfortable with and what do we need to do to define that position, right? What would work in that position and what wouldn't? And having the right person in that position in the first place. Because now that we have these documented processes that we can follow, if I bring someone on and they can't follow that process, it's a lot easier for me to let them go. Because I can say, hey, here's what we're looking for you to do. And unfortunately, you're missing two or three of these or five or six of these, whatever the case may be. I'm going to have to let you go. Hmm. I love it because I think it's one of the hardest things to do as a business owner is actually sit down and start start documenting, you know, because you're used to just doing everything. It's super easy for you to, do, you know, just get it done to actually start building the processes is challenging because you've never had to actually do it again, uh, you know, do it before, which is really, you know, I, again, I think that's part of the challenge, but also the value. Cause I imagine it's much easier to hire that second associate than the third associate uh, because, you know, they, you already have a lot of that documented. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it is definitely part of that process of, of growing a firm, uh, growing a business, I will say. And I think that, uh, you know, I addressed this in uh, another conversation I had with some planners. I said, you, you got to figure out what path you want to take. Not everyone's meant to be 
Not everyone needs to be a business owner. Some people maybe should work in a firm. Some people, you got to try them all out and figure out what path makes the most sense for you. Okay. So I worked at a firm. I've built my own firm. I started at the bottom, you know, like not being client facing and determined that I need to be in front of clients. I know that I'm a macro thinker, which means that I can, I can see big pictures and I can describe concepts and I can simplify ideas. But documentation and um, putting everything together and building everything, that's a little bit of a challenge. So finding someone that can complement that is important. Um, Jerry does that. So she compliments that. My, my current operations manager and Christy is, it has been a tremendous boon as well because we've been able to work through a system that works well for us. And so I think that that's an important distinction to have. Do you want to be an owner? And if you want to be an owner, where do you, where are you comfortable? For me, when I have client meetings, someone needs to be in that office with me taking notes because I cannot. <laughs> I hear you. I'm laughing because I'm on the same page. <laughs> Someone needs to be in there writing this stuff down because it's um, it's not gonna, I'm not going to remember everything. So either Jerry or Chrissy, uh, whichever is free at that time, is in every meeting so that everything gets followed through on and uh, we can make sure that our process is taken care of. So it, it really is a process to learn how to manage and, and learn how to outsource and delegate. But like you said, it you really you have to hire people with an opposing skill set uh, that you respect and i think that's where there there can be a breakdown if you feel like oh i know more than this person does and they're not getting their stuff done then there can be a lot of conflict whenever you're uh when you have polar opposite personalities but uh it is so important to surround yourself with with people that have other strengths i mean uh, you know we're big fans of strength finders uh, and the goal is that we shouldn't have at least not for a very long time. We shouldn't have two people with the same top five strengths. I mean, there are 34 total strengths, so the number of possible combinations is, is uh, extremely large. I'm not going to do that math in my head. But, you know, to, to be sure that we're surrounding each other with uh, with folks that have different strengths uh, to compensate for our weaknesses is extremely important because you can't do it all. Agreed. Absolutely. So one of the other conversations you and I have had in the past uh, is just around sort of family life and and how the business can have an effect both po- both positive and negative on on their personal life. And as listeners know, back from uh, my interview, I guess back in episode fifty, it's been over a year now. Uh, so I got divorced shortly after launching a business, uh, and it, it really was, um, I think. I don't think the business is what caused the divorce, but I think it was a sort of final nail in the coffin, if you will, because I think it was sort of my last thing that that sort of transitioned me into the person I wanted to be, which was as a owner, which was a very different person than the person that she married. And and so our relationship didn't make it through there. So you you have a a basketball team almost of children now. Um, (laughs) So you've got what, four four kids? I have four. I All have right, four so, kids are uh, five and under. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you can throw mine in there and, and, and we have a basketball team. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> How has that been? Because, and obviously this is a leading question that, you know, just because I, you and I have had this conversation before, but I guess what, what advice, I guess what, what's been going on in your life and sort of what advice do you have for listeners that, that maybe you're in a situation where they're starting to feel the, the relationship pains of being, an entrepreneur and, and what comes with that. The thing that I say in this space is you don't have to be on the same page, but you need to be in the same book, okay? at least in the same chapter. This is probably the hardest part of this, um, starting and building a business, because my ambitions when me and my wife, I'm currently married, um, we have our four children together and where we were when um I started the business and where we are today are, is not uh, is not the same place. Uh, I'd love to be able to say that that's all for the better, but it, it's not. Um, we've had challenges. I've been distracted um, and I found a passion without fully explaining or, um, or helping my partner transition with me. And so that's my part because for on my side, my belief was, well, we're married, we're husband and wife, we're a couple, and so everything that you do and everything that I do, we should 
you know, we should we should be on the same page on. We should fight through it completely together. I now know that that's not necessarily the truth because um, as much as I love my family, I, I love my business as well, and I love the things that I'm doing. And when you talk about finding your path, I think back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, even early 80s when the tradition was husband goes out, he gets a job, uh, the wife stays home with the children, or she puts her career on hold until the kids get out of the house, and then maybe she goes out and she, she does something and he retires and they live happily ever after. The reality is starting and building a business is labor intensive. It takes a lot of work. The idea and the concept of work-life balance really shifts from one, one person to the next. I'm perfectly fine working 60 or 70 hours a week, but that is uh, damn near impossible to do when you have another spouse that wants to work and you have children between the two of you that you have to work through. And I know that part of the reason I've been able to grow that I've at the rate that I've been able to grow at is because I've dedicated so much time and energy into my business. The reason I'm going to be able to continue to grow the business is because I believe in it so much. And the reason that I was able to get started in this industry and persevere was because I had a partner who believed in it and believed in me to kind of grow it. Now, the challenge is, as you go through the different phases of the business and you go through the different phases of your career, having a partner that can continue to walk lockstep with you through that and, and come hell or high water, push through it. We have struggled tremendously with that. Tremendously. Uh, I mean, we, uh, we, go, we go back and forth about conversations about what our future looks like together. And uh, one of those critical questions was asked of me pretty much this week. And, you know, here I am ripping off a Band-Aid and being fully open and fully transparent. It was the question was, hey, uh, honey or Bill, if I asked you to walk away from this for this from this business, what would you say? And my hesitation, I had to stop and I had to think about that. And I and I said, no, I wouldn't because I love what I do. And I think I have a tremendous impact and it's hard to find a passion and a strength. Some people will say um, it's hard to it's hard to replace your family and, and those things. And I absolutely agree with that because you know you, your family is your family, your kids are your kids, and they're part of you. But I know where I am today, and I know that to continue to be successful, it's going to require sacrifice. And some of that sacrifice. Let me back up. The sacrifice that it that it takes is you have to determine how much of it you're willing to take, and and where that needs to go. For me, some of that's personal, uh, some of that's professional. But I I love what I do. I love where I'm at. Um, I'm not afraid to to dedicate my my life to to what I do because I believe in it so much. And I didn't have it growing up. You know, I didn't have access to an advisor. I didn't know how money worked. Um, I didn't feel the ability to impact the lives of the people that I support in the same fashion. And I know that it's a struggle uh, for my partner uh, because so much depends on her at this point in time with the kids. And I do want to be supportive and I do want to be there for her, but I also want to grow my business. So in essence, what I'm saying is starting and building a business can be challenging on a marriage and can be challenging on the relationship. It can be challenging for the kids and you have to identify at what level and at how much risk you're willing to take in that space. Yeah, it's the, and thank you for, for being willing to share that and, and being so honest and transparent about it. It's the, it's the dark side of entrepreneurship for lack of a better phrasing. Uh, it's the side that not a lot of us talk about, uh, but I think a lot of us deal with. I know a lot of uh, advisors that in their first year or two of business do get divorced. And, you know, part, you know, in the pre-call, uh, you and I were talking about this a little bit. And, and I had said that, you know, it's this nasty uh, snowball effect sometimes of, you know, you know, the business is taking your attention and then, you know, things get a little rough at home. So you spend more time at, at the business and then things get worse at home. And it's this self-perpetuating cycle that can be so challenging to get out of. But also, you know, recognizing that, that when you are in a relationship, both partners have to have an appetite for risk and an appetite for the roller coaster. Even if, even if your partner's not literally on the roller coaster, 
Uh, they're good, you know, in, in, in that, I mean, they're not working in the business. They're on the roller coaster with you. And not everybody wants to be on that roller coaster. And I'm not sure that uh, we as, I don't think we even recognize it ourselves when we're starting the business, the roller coaster we're going to be on. And I'm not sure we always do the best job of of informing or educating because the significant other of what life's going to be like. Right. Yeah. There's a book called, uh, there's a book by Keith White. Uh, he's a, he's a uh, fortune 1000 biz, uh, business manager. He's come up, he was, he's an African American. One of the things that he talks about, there's a chapter in the book. Uh, it's, um, God, I can't remember the name of the book. I'll make sure to, I'll send it to you in an email and you can send it out to your, uh, to your listeners where he talks about his second and his third marriage and how as he grew in his profession and in his role uh, with large companies and his responsibilities grew, he had the challenge of trying to make sure that his personal life stayed uh, stayed on kilt and stayed on balance. And uh, what I loved about that was he talked about finding a partner or being with someone that doesn't necessarily have to have the same drive as you, but has an understanding of why it's important to you. And being married or being in a relationship with your partner, that's one of the key aspects of it. As an entrepreneur, your passion for your business or your passion for your your your, your chosen craft rivals that of your spouse, you know, your partner, the person that you that you that you love. As a business uh, broker, one of the things that we will talk about is I. it's hard for us to tell a person that their baby is ugly, right? <laughs> um, right. Uh, if, and that baby is your business because if you've worked in something for 10 or 20 or 30 years or whatever the time period is, that's your baby, right? You've nurtured it. You've grown it. You've created it. And... If you have multiple children, those children fight for your attention. I've got my son here with me now um, today. I've got one of my sons with me today. And he loves this one-on-one attention and he loves this time that we get to spend together. But when we go home, my son, my other son and my other daughter, um, number two and number three, I go by numbers now, <laughs> are going to be crawling all over me. And I know that Isaac is going to sit back and he's going to say, well, I had daddy all day. And can you imagine what that's going to do to the other two kids? Number three and number four. Number, uh, I'm sorry, number two and number three, uh, Noah and um, Olivia. Benji is still really, really small, so he's okay. Uh, but those are the challenges that we face as business owners. I have nights where I have to be here till 8 or 9 o'clock. I choose which networking events to go, and sometimes those fall on days that, that I needed to be home or there's something going on with the family. And then I have to make a choice. Sometimes I choose the family, sometimes I choose the business, and that's the reality of it. And unfortunately, it doesn't always work out, um, and it can it creates major stress and creates issues. Uh, I think that this is probably one of the most important things to, to discuss if you're going to be an entrepreneur, and if you're going to have a family, and if you're going to have a partner, to make sure that they understand what that what that road and what that long haul is going to look like because it will be difficult. It will be hard. It will, it can either tear you apart and make you stronger together. Yeah. I remember I was having a, a conversation with Carl Richards about this same topic. And, and I asked him, I was like, how do you find balance between work and family? And he said, there is no balance. There's, there's a finite amount of time and that time is going to get allocated However you choose to allocate it, X number of hours for the business, Y number of hours for the family, you know, other hours for exercise and, and you know, uh, participating in faith-based organ, like wh- whatever your faith is, like all of these various pieces are going to take your time. And there are times in our lives where we need to tilt, tilt the scales, where there are more hours dedicated to the business. And there are other times where we make the decision to, to tilt it back and, and more hours dedicated to family. And, and I think it's just important. One, I, I appreciate being willing to chat about this topic just because I think it's important for uh, one for for folks that are looking to become an entrepreneur to recognize that this may come. Uh, I would I would actually recommend go ahead and get into counseling. Like, go ahead and find a marriage counselor so that you can have someone you trust that can talk through some of these issues as they come up. But but also for the for the you know one or two year in firm owner that's starting to struggle. Uh, know that you're not alone. That this is something uh, many of us deal with. Again, on on a very that this is very common and very not talked about in our space. 
uh, it, like I said, it can be overcome and it, and it can be something that, that, you know, makes you stronger. Uh, and it's also something that they can break apart the relationship. And, and that's just the decisions that we make. There's no right or wrong. It just is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, that, that personal balance, that, that personal drive, that ambition, what got you to that point in that first, in the first place, you know, I, 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 I credit my wife and I thank my wife for helping me find the path because, uh, Usually with each step that I've taken um, at this point in my professional life, she was there. But I think the challenge was we didn't, we, we didn't together understand how much sacrifice and how much time it was going to take. And her expectations and her viewpoints and her background were, were different than mine. And so, you know, that plays a part in, in all of that. So if this, if this is going to be a passion, if, this is gonna, if you're going to be driven, if you're going to move in, that, uh, in this direction – decide what kind of business you're going to have. That's where lifestyle practices come in, right? So if you, you can have a lifestyle practice that allows you to work with few, you know, several, maybe 50 or 60 clients total, maybe you're generating two or $300,000 a year at some point in time, you're vacationing every other week or whatever the case may be. And if that's the direction that you want to go, then that's great. You still have to build to that point. I don't want a lifestyle practice. I really love what I do. I, I'd like to be able to help as many people as I can. I'd like to be able to expand my office. I want to be able to take a month off in the summertime and then take two weeks off in the wintertime. And then that's it. And then just really enjoy being around people and helping them, helping change their lives. In order for me to build a business like that, that, that matches where I want to be and what my aspirations are, um, it, it, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of my, my time. Absolutely. So what is, what's on the roadmap for you? What are you working on now as you look forward and, and, you know, the business has obviously been growing very quickly. You're hiring sort of what, what's next for you uh, in what you're going to be working on over the next, you know, let's say six to 12, 18 months. Great. So I, I plan on uh, in essence, doubling my AUM uh, and I'd like to be able to, I don't necessarily want to license, but I'd like to be able to speak more on uh, the process of planning and different pricing models. So I'd really like to be able to go into the maybe the coaching space for advisors um, and adding that to something to maybe help them be successful in building their businesses or identifying what type of practice they want to be. Um, we're going to be adding an associate planner uh, to the practice so that we can continue to scale the business over the next six to 12 months. Um, and that's what our focus is going to be. I want to streamline this process uh, even further and maybe help other advisors mimic or, or, or copy it so that they can be successful as well. You know, learn from my mistakes. I'm also starting, uh, I just recently started a, a blog series called Advisors After Hours. It's a video blog where I discuss these things. You know, um, I talk about my failures and my successes. Um, I just recently published my most recent one, which talked about my first client, my first real financial planning experience. And I will tell you, I'll give you a little bit of a, a teaser. It was an absolute disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and it taught me the value of uh, uh, um, clear communication and, and focusing on clients' uh, emotional and intrinsic needs versus their quantitative. And it's also one of the catalysts to my business model today. So I'm working on that. Um, I'm working on that video blog series. You can find it. It's called Advisors After Hours. And it's on YouTube. And also, I plan on just sharing personal and professional successes and failures uh, as my career continues to grow and blossom. I'd also like to be more involved with uh, the association. And, uh, and when I say association, uh, the FPA association and financial planning in general to, to talk about diversity and inclusion. I am a, uh, I am a Haitian American um, financial planner. And you don't really see very many of me. And so I'd like to be able to change that down the line and have our profession, our industry, uh, have a better mix or be a better representation of what America, Americana actually is. Yeah. And uh, the plan is to have you as well as a, another advisor on uh, back on the show because we had a wonderful discussion at the FPABE event. Uh, around diversity and, and the conversation about diversity. So I'm very excited to have you back on the show 
uh, here in the next few weeks to uh, to come back and and so that we can explore that conversation, rehash some of the things we talked about, but just expand on that because uh, it's such a critical conversation to be having. So as we're coming to a close, uh, I'll ask you the final question, and that is if you could go back and tell you know younger Bill. Maybe this was the bill that was looking at launching his own firm or back at the insurance company. But if you could go back and tell your younger self uh, one piece of advice, the one thing you wish you knew then that you know now, what do you think that piece of advice would be? Start sooner and don't be afraid to fail. So much easier said than done, huh? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I wish I would have started sooner. I wish I, I wish I would have transitioned to the RIA space a little bit sooner. And I wish I would have. Uh, I wish I would have taken some of. The, I, I wish I wouldn't have been so afraid to fail. And and what I mean by that is in in charging services and asking for the business, asking for the business for from clients, stepping outside of my comfort zone. And you know, when you speak with me and when you meet with me, um, people very rarely think that I have such a thing as a as being uncomfortable. And I do. I'm actually more of an introvert than most people think. And I tend to hide my uh, I tend to hide my emotions uh, fairly well. I've learned to compartmentalize. Thank you, United States Marine Corps. I appreciate that. You know, um, <laughs> I'll teach you that. Uh, but uh, being not being not being so concerned with okay, well, you're going to fail, and it, it it might not work down the path that you think it will. Um, I probably I would be three years further along had I stepped out a little bit sooner and uh, failed sooner. And so that would be the one thing that I would tell myself. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to come onto the show and, and share your path and, and your business, which is absolutely rocking right now. And, and, and so both the highs and the lows that, that you know, honestly, we all experience in, in this journey that is entrepreneurship. So thank you for being willing to come on and, and share your story with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alan, for the opportunity. And anytime, uh, I think I owe you a beer. <laughs> Hopefully so. <laughs> Good to go. Absolutely. Be sure to join our VIP community at xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to hang out with other XYPN radio listeners, ask questions for future mailbag episodes with myself and Kitsis, and to finally find a community of like-minded financial advisors. Thanks so much for joining me today. We'll see you next time. You're not alone and you're not crazy. It's scary starting, building, and growing your own financial planning firm. And that's why we put together a free private community just for you, the Cutting Edge Financial Planner. Go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP or text XYPN Radio to 33344 and join a network of thousands ready to change the lives of Gen X and Gen Y clients.